So yeah, my name is Natasha. Um, I'm just finishing up my PhD at the University of Central Lancashire in the UK. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the development of the Insider Language Index, which is a composite measure to detect insider threat. And this forms part of my wider PhD research in which I'm looking at insider threat through individual language use. So what exactly are insiders? Well, insiders are often present or former employees or business partners who have legitimate access to a company's information, but they compromise this information for malicious reasons, and that could be for revenge or for personal gain. The threat that insiders pose to organisations continues to be a significant concern. For example, in 2016, a former employee at Google became unhappy with his engineering role at Google's self-driving car project. And so he decided to steal 14,000 Google files, which related to a $1.1 billion technology project. And he sold these information to Uber, his new employer. This data breach demonstrates the extent to which undetected insider threats can have significant and detrimental losses for our organizations. And it presents a need for us as researchers to do better. So the majority of insider threat literature has focused on technology and developing technologies that help organizations monitor who is accessing their systems. But this doesn't really help the organization because once that system has been accessed, the attack has occurred and the company is therefore on their way to losing a lot of money. So my research attempts to solve this problem. And so I look at the insider threat problem from the perspective of the human in the hopes that we can decipher the similarities and differences between insiders and non-insiders so that we can help those organizations detect a potential insider before the attack occurs. And to do this, I focus on language. So when considering the current insider threat literature, like I said before, there isn't much research really um, that has looked at language specifically, but there is some growing research to suggest that some language characteristics, for example, pronoun use, pronouns such as I and we, um, language related to negative emotion and language related to cognitive processing can actually be useful to focus on when we're trying to detect these deceptive and malicious insiders. So, for example, when we think about first person singular pronoun use, so that would be pronouns such as I, previous research has found that this is associated with an increase in self-focus and a decrease in organisational commitment, which is often found to be the experience of insiders. Other research has found that actually those first person plural pronouns such as we are associated with a decrease in that self-focus and an increase in community spirit and that sense of belonging. For example, research conducted by Cohen et al in 2004 found that after the September 11 attack of the Twin Towers in 2001, people started to use an increased number of these personal pronouns such as we as they dealt with that incident together. So negative effect is another language characteristic that has been found to be associated with these deceptive insiders. And the presence of this language category comes from the idea that these insiders are often frustrated or disgruntled with their company. And that might be because, you know, they haven't been offered a promotion or their companies fail to recognize their accomplishments. And so as a result, they become deceptive insiders for reasons such as revenge. So research has found that this is associated with workplace behaviours. For example, research conducted by Workman et al. in 2007 found that people who were more disgruntled and frustrated actually showed an increase in this negative workplace behaviours. For example, organisational theft increased um, in this study. And so we can start to see the similarities here between that of organisational behaviour and insider activity. A third linguistic difference between insiders and non-insiders relates to the cognitive load that can sometimes be experienced by insiders. For example, when an insider is about to conduct their deceptive task, they may have to exert additional mental effort. And this is because they still have to carry out their daily workplace tasks, but they also have their insider tasks to carry out as well. And so their ability to process this information can result in reduced cognitive clarity. 
and this can often present itself through their language, as insiders might use an increased number of words related to cognitive processing. These are words like um and hum when they're struggling to kind of process everything that's going on. So taken together then, previous research suggests that these linguistic characteristics, for example, pronoun use, negative effect, and words related to cognitive processing may be useful to focus on when attempting to kind of detect these deceptive insiders. And these form the first three hypotheses of this current study. And we also hypothesize that actually, when they become more immersed in their attack, when they become more confident as an insider, these language differences would present themselves to a greater extent. And this is where hypothesis four comes in. So the data that was used in this study consisted of unexplored workplace interviews that were originally conducted by Taylor et al. in 2013. So Taylor's study was one of the first studies to investigate inside a threat through language. And as these interviews had never been looked at before, I thought it'd be interesting to see what these interviews were showing us about insiders and their language use. So Taylor et al. originally in 2013, tested the hypothesis that conducting an insider attack can lead to cognitive and social challenges that may impact their daily workplace behavior. So the participants in their study took part in a four part workplace simulation, which took approximately six hours and they were required to examine databases and exchange information with each other as part of a team in order to solve organized crimes. Now, about after two hours in the study, a quarter of those participants were incentivized to act as insiders. And during the simulation, they communicated by email alone. And so it was the, these emails that were later analyzed using linguistic inquiry and word counts to derive those measures of language use. So these included words such as I and we, the pronoun group, negative emotion words, and those words again related to cognitive processing. So my study was a four times two mixed subjects design, which explored insider threat through language use. So we looked at the variables I, negative emotion words and cognitive processing, similar to that of Taylor et al 2013. We didn't use we and the pronoun we, and this is because in the Taylor study, they didn't find any significant differences with that pronoun. And so we chose to eliminate it from the current study. The data that we used were transcripts of the 54 interviews that were conducted by Taylor et al. in 2013. And these interviews took place after they'd completed the workplace simulation that I mentioned before. Again, this involved those participants working together to solve organized crimes. But what's particularly important about their study is that in parts two, three, and four of the simulation, nine individuals received that incentive to act as an insider. And so they were conducting malicious and deceptive tasks without the other participants knowing and providing that information to a provocateur. Additionally, as they become more immersed into the simulation, so for example, in parts three and four of the simulation, the tasks that they were required to complete as an insider increased in difficulty. And then after that workplace simulation had finished, the all participants were told that there had been a security breach and that their behavior during that simulation would now be investigated in a post simulation interview. Specifically prior to this interview, the insiders received an additional monetary incentive to deceive the interviewer by hiding their malicious activity and by pretending that they were honest non insiders throughout that workplace simulation. What was really interesting within these interviews is that the interviewer had access to their behavior during the simulation. So they had access to the databases that the participants had accessed, the emails that they sent. And so if the interviewee in their interview was not being honest about what they'd been up to during the simulation, this could be picked up on by those interviewers and they could then be questioned on it. And it was these interviews which were audio and video recorded that formed the data set for this study. So once we had these interviews, we transcribed them using an online transcription service. And we split each of the transcripts into each of the four game parts as we really wanted to see what was going on before any insider activity happened. So in game part one, 
compared to those later game parts when some participants took on the role of an insider. And so consistent with the previous research, for example, Taylor et al, individual language use was examined using linguistic inquiry and word count. So this is a this analyzes a text file on a word by word basis, and it calculates the total percentage of words that fit into specific language categories. And again, we were looking for those language categories such as pronoun use, negative emotion words, and words related to cognitive processing. So our results revealed that compared to non-insiders, insiders actually used more words related to cognitive processing. So they used more words such as um and hmm as they were struggling to process what the interview was saying and to answer um, in a deceptive way. And this supported hypothesis three. We also found that compared to non-insiders, insiders used more negative emotion words supporting hypothesis two. And they also used more self-referential terms. So again, that's those pronouns such as I, as they met, took themselves away from the team's goals and focused on their own goals as an insider. Supporting in, in support of hypothesis four, we also found that in those later game parts, game parts three and four, the insiders were more confident. And so actually those language um, differences did vary to a greater extent compared to non-insiders. So these results suggest that insiders have a distinctive language pattern that differs from non-insiders and that a focus on these differences could aid our ability to detect those malicious insiders. And based on these findings, we developed an insider language index, which is a composite measure of insider language use. An insider language index was calculated for each game part of each participant. And so to do this, we calculated standardized Z scores and aggregated the scores based on the language categories that were found to be significantly different for insiders. So as you can see from the graph here, interviewees with higher ILI scores used a greater amount of insider language throughout their interviews. This was consistent as all nine insiders had much higher ILI scores than all of the non-insiders. Additionally, Insiders had higher ILI scores during parts three and four of the game, again, evidencing that as they become more immersed in the deceptive tasks, they actually use a greater proportion of this language. So this study has advanced the idea that the language used by insiders and non-insiders is different, and that if we focus on these differences, we could then improve our ability to detect insiders. In line with previous research, our results revealed that insiders use personal pronouns, negative motion words, and words related to cognitive processing more than honest non-insiders. And based on these findings, we were able to develop an insider language index um, that incorporates the words used most and least frequency by insiders throughout the Taylor et al. interviews. So what does this mean then moving forward? Well, specifically, Throughout this study, I'd say a critical contribution would be the development of an index that differentiates insiders who are deceptive and malicious between non-insiders who are honest. And it presents these differences based on their patterns of language use. Specifically, this is the first index of its kind that measures language features unique to insider activity. So currently there are no other indexes that can do this. Theoretically, this advances our understanding of the extent to which language can aid our understanding of individual cognition and motivation. And practically, it opens up the potential for the development of language-based models of malintent that can be used in the early detection of insider threat. And this specific early detection can then help those organizations prevent further losses, such as the ones by Google in 2016. Thank you very much for listening.